Hello, everyone. Everyone, I'd like to welcome you, if everyone could take a seat. And for those who are standing in the back, I see a few seats open if you'd prefer to sit. Good morning and welcome to today's discussion. My name is William Wexler. I lead the Middle East programs here at the Atlantic Council. Um, thank you all for joining us and especially to our distinguished guests and speakers, General James Cartwright, Dr. Dov Zakheim, Ali Shahabi, and Joyce Karam. Thank you as well to our partners and sponsors for today's event, uh, the Arabia Foundation. And I want to uh, make sure that I acknowledge um, uh, two of the Atlantic Council's board members that are in attendance, uh, Ambassador Tom Pickering um, and Gair uh, Westgard. Um, you know, at the Atlantic Council, like all of you, we've been following developments in the Gulf extremely closely. And I'm glad to be here today with these distinguished panelists to have an opportunity to delve deeper into the details of the back and forth escalation that we're witnessing, as well as the policy options and limitations and implications that we have. We brought this panel together for a dual purpose. Uh, first, to convene an important discussion around recent events in the Gulf, what they mean for the United States and what they mean for our allies. And second, we're here to launch a very timely issue brief reporting the results of a war game we co-hosted with the Arabia Foundation. Um, that, that's right here. Um, Avenues for Conflict in the Gulf, a Matrix Game Simulation, authored by our game runner and senior fellow, John Watts. Um, John, thank you very much for, uh, where are you, John? Where, oh, there you are. Uh, please stand up, make sure that John led this war game, um, uh, did a really great job, and please do, if you have a chance, take a look at this report because it's quite an impressive uh, uh, result of what was a lot of work from a lot of people. Um, many of the key conclusions in this paper concern the nature and the trajectory of Iran's role in the region. Uh, the participants in the game determine that Iran prefers uh, to act asymmetrically um, through proxies, covert actions, and creative but uh, very calculated escalations. Uh, moving up that escalation ladder, constantly testing us, testing its adversaries to figure out where different actions are in different, in different uh, venues, um, all to achieve its foreign policy goals. And more recently, that's really what we've seen. Um, and so given everything that's going on in the Gulf, the panelists will consider whether or not they agree with, uh, uh, with that, and that's where this is gonna be going in the future. Um, and uh, if there's a point in the future where Iran missteps or intentionally deviates from this current path. We're lucky to benefit from having two of our distinguished board members here today on the panel. The first is General James Cartwright. Uh, General Cartwright retired after over 40 years of service in the U.S. Marine Corps, most recently, of course, as Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, after having served as Commander of U.S. Strategic Command. Um, our second Atlanta Council board member on the panel is uh, Dr. Dov Zakheim. He is currently a senior fellow at CNA and a senior advisor to the Chief of Naval Operations. Among his many senior positions in government was Under Secretary of Defense as the Comptroller, Chief Financial Officer for the Department of Defense, Deputy Under Secretary of Defense for Planning and Resources, and more. Um, our next panelist, uh, Mr. Ali uh, Shahibi, is founder of the Arabia Foundation, a think tank focused on the geopolitics and socioeconomics of the region with a particular focus, of course, on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, prior to starting up the Arabia Foundation, Ali wrote two books focused on Saudi Arabia and potential Gulf conflict after retiring from a career in banking and finance where he founded his own GCC-focused private equity fund. And lastly, but certainly not least, um, Joyce Karam will moderate today's conversation. She is Washington correspondent for The National, an adjunct professor at George Washington University. Our reporting spans the entire Middle East, and she has been following and reporting on recent events very closely. Um, uh, thank you very much, all of you, for, uh, for participating in today's panel. Um, I would uh, like to remind all of you and everyone in the audience that today's conversation is on the record. Um, there will be, uh, after a moderated conversation, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. I want to just uh, focus on those two words there for a second. It's questions 
and answers. Uh, it is not soliloquies and reflections. It is not monologues and uh, responses. It is questions and answers. So uh, please raise your hand. Um, uh, Joyce will, will call on you and ask a question. Um, I welcome you to also follow along and join us on Twitter uh, at, a at AC Scowcroft and the hashtag AC Iran. With that, I welcome the panel to the stage. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, being here. Thanks for the Atlantic Council, the Schoolcraft Center, the Arabia Foundation uh, for putting together this uh, timely uh, event. Uh, first, a word uh, on the report. I really enjoyed reading it, but I have to tell you, I got to wonder if when you guys met in December, if you had any special intel or any crystal <laughs> ball on what's uh, about to happen in the Gulf five months later. Um, the report, uh, in my opinion, it plays, uh, it plays out realistic scenarios uh, of what could happen uh, with Iran uh, and Gulf countries. Uh, those include Yemen, uh, Syria, and uh, an irregular proxy incursion by Iran into East uh, Saudi Arabia. However, all three, all three scenarios, unlike uh, some of the conventional wisdom you see on Twitter or here in Washington, D.C., have not led to direct war uh, with Iran. Uh, according to the report, confrontation is not desirable by either, uh, direct confrontation is not desirable by either Iran or, uh, or, its, uh, uh, or the Gulf countries. Uh, but looking at the situation in the Gulf today, looking at the recent uh, escalation uh, since May, uh, at least 12 incidents involving tankers uh, in, in, in the Gulf, starting uh, by uh, May 12 in, in Fujairah and the UAE, uh, the question of a miscalculation, unwanted confrontation is back on the table. This, of course, did not happen in isolation, does not happen by coincidence, nothing happens by coincidence in, in the Middle East. Uh, the U.S. decision to leave the nuclear deal in 2018, Iran's expansion in the region since the Iraq War in 2003, unmitigated regional conflicts from Syria to Yemen to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict have all contributed to the impasse uh, we're seeing today. So this, to discuss all of this, it's great uh, to, to be with among colleagues and uh, uh, friends. Uh, good to see Ali, not on Twitter. Uh, Ali Shehabi to, to my left, director of the Arabia Foundation, uh, General Caltright, General Caltright to my left too, sorry, to skip Dov, um, uh, whom I covered uh, during the Obama uh, administration in length, and uh, Dov, uh, Zachim, he told me, Zachim, it's not Zachim. Uh, he's uh, not a descendant from the great uh, district of North Lebanon. Um, from the Bush administration. Uh, it's great to have them all here. And uh, we're going <laughs> to kick off the discussion by giving everybody uh, you know, an opportunity to give short introductory remarks, short introductory remarks, and then uh, we'll have a uh, discussion between us, then we'll turn to you uh, for uh, the Q&A. So, uh, General, why don't we start with you? I appreciate the opportunity and, um, and uh, the opportunity to also, the Atlantic Council has taken both to connect the war game to a discussion on strategy um, uh, today. Um, my assignment was inside of five minutes to solve the problem. Um, <laughs> I will take a different perspective, um, and I'll, I'll give you some background on that perspective. Uh, when I entered um, service in the late 1960s, um, <laughs> then, then um, uh, my first assignment as a uh, flight school guy, um, pilot, uh, everybody in my class was Iranian. Very different world. We partied together. Our families grew up together. So that's how I started. It wasn't six years later that I was figuring out how to attack. 
and prevent attacks <laughs> in the Middle East associated with Saudi Arabia, and all of the people in my flight school magically disappeared, um, unfortunately, and their families. But, um, but this has been an issue, and, and so I'm going to take the nuclear side of this discussion and start there. And the first thing I want to say is their, their program started in 1957. This is not something new, <laughs> okay? And we were dealing it, we have been dealing with it since 1957 in one way or another, in one venue or another, okay? And from one perspective or another. But the current situation, to jump all the way now forward, um, we're in a mis uh, military escalatory environment, okay? Um, they're probing, we're responding, um, they're using different, different venues, all to be, to remain short of direct confrontation, because certainly in the eyes of the Iranians, while they may get a quick start, it will not last long. A conventional fight just isn't going to last long for them, for them to export it outside their country. It's just going to be tough, okay? Um, the question now is, can we bring diplomacy to bear in some kind of a new deal? something that changes the dynamic out there. And the strategy that's been applied to that, you know, really has been to avoid direct confrontation, to leave room for a, a, a negotiation. Um, if, if you go back and look, and I'm going to go back as far as 2014, um, statement to the Congress, sufficient, Iran possesses sufficient HEU, highly enriched uranium, to produce approximately eight nuclear weapons. Okay, that was 2014. The timeline associated with that, when we entered into the JCPOA, as stated in testimony by Wendy Sherman at the time, was that um, we were going to eliminate all of the 20% enriched uranium and most of the 5% enriched, and they were going to take the timeline to build a nuclear weapon from three months to one year. That was the objective. Um, that, that, that was what was stated. Now we come forward to May of 18, and the president pulls out of the agreement for a, a, a significant number of reasons uh, and justifications, and certainly not everybody agreed with that. In July, uh, I said not everybody. In July of 19, so that's 14 months later, um, Iran announces that they have exceeded the caps. How, how much does that relate to the one year? Um, the other three steps necessary for them to get to a nuclear weapon are first, um, and they don't have to be sequential, is to restart the construction on a heavy water reactor. Okay, that's, that's one. The second is to restart the mothballed um, uh, centrifuges. And the third is to no longer allow the IAEA to come in and conduct inspections. Restarting the reactor is tough. Not necessary, but tough, and it would be necessary for a sustained capability to build nuclear weapons. The centrifuge is pretty straightforward. They've all been mothballed. They all be, can be brought out, and, and engineering could, could get them going again. And we are in a position right now where the IAEA, while it is still there, is being denied on a regular basis. Okay? So that's the one year. Um, the IAEA's assessment, today as it stands in July, um, they can restart, that Iran can restart weapons production on very short notice. That's the IAEA's uh, look. In a report to Congress in July of this year, it was clearly stated that Iran possesses the technology and the industrial capacity to produce nuclear weapons. The only caveat was they, the quality of those weapons in the final integration is not yet understood. Now what that means, it's not understood by the Iranians or not understood by us and our intelligence, I don't know. <laughs> okay? But that's, that's where we stand today. Um, so with that, basically, my assessment as an Iranian is the sanctions hurt. I've got to do something. The military options that I'm currently employing, um, I don't want to get into a direct conflict because that's going to hurt me. Okay? But 
I'm willing to conduct things below the level and try to manage the, the, the escalation. So in the na on the naval side, I'm going to do seizures and limited strikes on vessels. I'm going to do different things that impose cost on anybody who wants to conduct shipping in the, in the uh, Gulf. The second thing is, an interesting one, is I'm willing to shoot down <coughs> aircraft as long as they're not manned. The U.S. is not going to allow another Gary Powers. Okay, so I'm willing to do that, and it seems to be acceptable, and it seems to be working. I can do it with almost impunity. And the third on the ground is that I'm regionally going to fix all of the adversarial forces in the region using terrorism and the export of terrorism um, to third parties. And, and I've, I've accomplished that. Now, the question is, how do I transition to a dialogue in which I have a position of power and leverage in that dialogue with the United States? How do I get from where I am to that point? You know, and quite frankly, um, why would I? And, and this will be the controversial part, and, and hopefully you, people will disagree. My opinion is that we're already in breakout. We've already established that. Okay? We're going to do it covertly, as covertly as possible. Mm -hmm. And we're only going to disclose based on events, not on timelines, as to how far we've gotten on that process. And we'll try to cover our tracks to the maximum extent possible to draw that time out to give us time. Okay? Um, so it's an event-based disclosure strategy um, associated with building a stockpile. Um, most likely, we're going to carry the region into an arms race. Nuclear arms race. Nuclear arms race, but an arms race in general also. Reestablish a Cold War-like environment in the region where others have to copy us. That the risks associated with it would be too great not to, but they will be years behind us. Okay. I have no reason to continue in good faith in the, in the um, negotiations because nobody's under addressing my underlying security issues. Everything's about punishing me. Nothing's about solving the problems I have in the region. So I have no reason to actually close on, on a negotiation. I assess that the U.S. is going to prepare to initiate direct confrontation. But I have also assessed that the U.S. has neither the will nor the desire, um, tactically or strategically, to sustain a long-term direct attack that would lead to occupation. Hmm. Okay. So I will win, and we will enter into a Cold War race, which I have the advantage in. And it will allow me to interact with the Chinese, the Russians, on energy issues, on export issues, and eventually through Syria and into the Mediterranean with Europe. That's, that's my assessment. It's fascinating, uh, very sober. Uh, no, Doth? Well, uh, you asked me to talk about the American side, which is very hard because there is no one American side. Um, but I'll try to address some of the issues, and, and in many ways, I'm on the same page as General Cartwright. It was interesting, you asked me to talk about the military thing, and I'm sitting next to the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, but okay. <laughs> I paid his bills. Um, <laughs> uh, look, you have to start off with the fact that Donald Trump doesn't want a war, full stop. You also have to take into account the fact that Vladimir Putin doesn't want a war, full stop. The only people who really want a war, and I'll let the Saudis speak for themselves, other than the Saudis perhaps, and I say perhaps, you, you'll address that, are the Israelis. But even the Israelis are very careful about what exactly it is they want, and, and I'll get back to that. Now, of course, we, we, we've got over 100 aircraft in al Udaid, not exactly very far from Iran. We've got an aircraft carrier which almost doubles the number of aircraft. Um, we could take out facilities, Kerman Shah, Tabriz, whatever. We could probably give Tehran a pretty difficult time. Um, 
the question is, what if we did? Okay. So first of all, we know that Qasem Soleimani is not exactly stupid. He's not going to respond directly. And so, and I'll get to why we might even do this in the first place, but let me just continue. Um, if he doesn't respond directly, then we've got a very, very different problem. We've got a worldwide problem. Now, if we want to have a bigger strike, that starts to tax our resources elsewhere in the world. I mean, after all, China hasn't gone away. The South China Sea hasn't gone away. The, the Mediterranean hasn't gone away. Syria hasn't gone away. Even Venezuela hasn't gone away. So where are we going to find all these extra resources? That's, that's a concern as well. And troops. We needed a half a million to go into Iraq. Shinseki, General Shinseki said we needed 300,000 to keep Iraq under control. Um, how many do you need for a country four times the size of Iraq? At least a half a million, I would argue. Correct me if I'm wrong, sir. So what can we do instead? We can continue to strangle them economically, which we are doing. And Instex, the European facility, isn't exactly working out. Now, why do I say, for instance, that Putin doesn't want a war? I mean, we understand why Trump doesn't want a war. He made a campaign promise. Not only that, um, unless the war started tomorrow when, you know, basically Americans get tired of wars after about a year. Okay, so if he, if he starts the war six months before the election, Trump's reelected because Americans always support the president for the first year. <laughs> always happens. There's a bump up, no matter who the president is. So unless he starts a war tomorrow, it's not going to happen. And Trump doesn't want to do it. The public doesn't want it. Well, why doesn't Putin want to do it? Well, let me give you one example. Bibi Netanyahu is, just, is inviting Putin to visit Israel just before the September 17th election. And they're going to have a great memorial to the heroism of Leningrad. What that, uh, by the way, Netanyahu, I've been told, speaks to Putin at least once a week. And he's visited Moscow 10 times in the last year, which is a lot more than Washington. So, and, and it isn't because Putin particularly loves Netanyahu. There's, there's a mutual benefit here. So from the Russian perspective, get, Israel getting into a war is not exactly a great thing. And of course, they don't want Iran to get into a war either. But they don't want Iran to be nuclear. That's the one thing that, that has to be considered. The last thing they want, and the last thing the Chinese want, is a nuclear Iran. That's why they actually supported the JCPOA. So you've got a lot of factors pushing against any kind of uh, direct conflict. Now, the Israelis would love to attack Iran themselves if, if they can't get us to do it, which they really want. We should be their proxy. It's kind of a uh, tail wagging the dog thing. But they're not going to attack Iran. They've attacked north of Baghdad now, reportedly twice. That's OK. That's not Iran. Syria is not Iran. So on that side of it, you're not going to see that kind of an attack. Now, what about the Iranians attacking the Israelis? The Israelis have at least four levels of, air defense, of missile defenses now. They've got Thad. They've got two kinds of arrows. They've got Patriot. They're building a, a replacement for Patriot and David Sling. You start running the numbers. What kill probability do you want to assign to what the Israelis have? 0.8? In that case, there's less than one half of a percent chance that an Iranian missile will, or a couple of missiles or three missiles will get through. That's assuming they don't hit the Mediterranean. Now, unless you're totally suicidal and living in Tehran, do you really want to create a situation where nuclear fallout hits Mecca? That kind of undermines your claim to Mecca. So the Iranians, I'm not sure, are going to attack the Israelis. The Israelis, I'm not sure, are going to attack the Iranians. The Russians don't want it. <coughs> we don't, excuse me, don't want it. So where's the war? I'll stop there. Uh, Ali, you were just in Saudi Arabia. You've, you've you know, I'm, I can tell from your uh, Twitter feed that you, you do talk to people. So does Saudi want a war with Iran? And where do you see the situation? Yeah, I, I think there's a fundamental misconception um, in Washington that um, Saudi Arabia and the UAE want war. Now, it's a truism in politics that geography makes a difference. So obviously, sitting right there facing Iran, 
the situation is much more dire and urgent and risky than it is sitting at the Atlantic Council in Washington. Uh, so <coughs> the perspective has to be different. Mm. Uh, but first of all, they understand that, that, Trump, that Mr. Trump doesn't want the war, that the American public doesn't want the war, and they understand that they will be the first target, whether it is cities in the UAE or whether it is Saudi oil infrastructure. Because um, a primary objective in any war by the Iranians will be to try and push the price of oil up. The best way you can do that is trying to destroy critical nodes of infrastructure, Saudi oil infrastructure. Now, Saudi Arabia has been preparing for that for decades, um, not just in <coughs> from a military perspective, but from an engineering perspective. Um, a lot of um, backup capabilities have been put in place. Um, a lot of facilities have been spread out. Uh, crews are trained to, um, to fix things very quickly. Uh, we saw that when they hit a pumping station, when the drone hit the pumping station, which actually came out of Iraq, now we understand, not Yemen. And that surprisingly did not get much, in, much in traction. Yambua, right? in so Yamba, Yambua, and uh, no, it came, yeah, I mean, it was, on, uh, it was on the oil pipeline between the east and the west. But they were able to put it back on in less than 24 hours. So, uh, I mean, Aramco, the oil company, has been uh, living with this risk for decades, and they're very prepared. So the odds that the Iranians will be able to make a major dent into uh, uh, Saudi oil production are not that high. But it is still there, and then you have a psychological impact also. And then you have the psychological impact on the tankers. We've already seen uh, tanker um, insurance rates shoot up. But cognizant of all of this, I think people, people don't appreciate that, that I think both Saudi Arabia and the UAE uh, see the best strategy as the continuation of what is happening now, which is the continued sanctions and the continued pressure on Iran and an attempt to affect behavioral change. Now, Saudi Arabia is much more skeptical of Iran and its potential to change and its willingness to honestly negotiate um, than a lot of American, uh, whether it's policymakers or thinkers are. Uh, I think uh, the kingdom has had a history, uh, first of all, starting from day one of the revolution, when the revolution called for the, the destruction of the royal family, um, multiple events of terrorism uh, that they can trace back to Iran, and a, a, you know, a number of, of, of serious attempts to reach out to the Iranians under Rafsanjani, under Rouhani, uh, even under Ahmed, Ahmadinejad. Right. And, and there were, there were you know, visits and there were discussions and there was a security uh, actually, Rouhani signed a security agreement with Saudi Arabia. The Iranians have broken every promise they've made. But wouldn't you say that when we had Saudi-Iranian rapprochement, when we had talks going on, the tension was less, the specifically in the 90s? Well, the overt tension was less, but what is happening on the ground went forward. You see, that's what scares Saudi Arabia. In other words, the, the encroachment, whether it's into Lebanon or into Iraq or into Syria or into Yemen, uh, Iran's long-term plan, which is seen in the kingdom as wanting to dominate the Gulf one way or another, whether by coercion, whether by direct control. Uh, Iran is a, is, is, see, is a failed economy, like revolutions are. The revolutions don't know how to uh, feed their people. Um, uh, revolutions know how to fight. And Iran is a, is a, is a brilliant case example of that. They're only, their major export a major successful export is not an iPhone. It's the world's best uh, non-state actor, which is Hezbollah. So that's what they know how to do. And they're doing it very well. And they're going to use that core competency, in our view, to extract political and economic concessions from the world. Uh, they're looking for America to leave the Gulf, and they want to become the hegemon uh, of the Gulf and extract from the Gulf states and from the world uh, benefits. 
So that's the nightmare, and that's why Saudi Arabia takes what's happening in Yemen as seriously as it does. Uh, and I think a very important develop development that people have not picked up much uh, the last few weeks was that American troops have come back to Saudi Arabia. Right, the and Sultan. Uh, and Prince Sultan Sultan's Air Base, which was actually built uh, before Al Udaid in Qatar. It was built to be the major American air base in the region. And then bin Laden came along, and Al Qaeda came along, and, and, and the jihadis came along and made so much noise about um, you know, the Americans in the holy places that in those days it became awkward uh, for Saudi Arabia. What is interesting here is that the government, Saudi government realized that Saudi public opinion has changed. That, that the appeal of the jihadist uh, message, first of all, has, has been very much weakened. And the Saudi public understands that Iran is an immediate threat. But the base is not necessarily, I mean, my understanding that negotiations had started before uh, the current escalation uh, with sure. Iran to reopen the base. Engineers were on the ground in, I guess, in June. Yeah, no, so I'm not just saying that they, ca they happened as a result of last week. These things take time, okay. obviously. But I think the concept, the idea that, that Saudi Arabia has opened its doors uh, and, and at the end of the day, the Prince Sultan Air Base has an advantage over all the other bases that America has, which is it's physically much farther away from Iran. Okay. Uh, so uh, particularly against missile attack, it, it just makes it that much uh, easier to defend uh, American assets and personnel in the region. Excellent. Uh, General, I want to go back uh, to you. Let's say um, we finish this panel. Hopefully by, uh, by noon you get a call from the White House, uh, either the President or National Security Advisor uh, John Bolton wants to see you. They want uh, recommendations uh, on, uh, on Iran. What would you tell them? Is the current strategy working? Continue with sanctions? Go back to the deal? Lift sanctions and get a new deal? Because Iran will not come to the table unless the U.S. Uh, removes some of the oil uh, sanctions, at least. Um, <laughs> this has happened once or twice before, but um, you know, my sense here is that um, we have for many years been pursuing a strategy of um, deterrent delay with a rhetoric of deny but the two don't match. So it is now time to bring those into alignment in some way. Now you can, ideally you want to do it through diplomacy and um, if we go the dip diplomatic route, which I hope we can, um, then part of the discussion is to understand the broader needs and aspirations that Iran has and the difficulty in that discussion is that we are so committed to our allies that creating an, a security environment in which Iran is an equal or, or whatever is going, would be very difficult in a, in a negotiation. Difficult for our allies, difficult for ourselves, because we would probably have to break some promises. So that would be tough, but still preferable, okay? Um, at the same time, um, you have to put in place a credible capability to, at the very least, delay um, the activities. And um, given the way the escalation ladder has gone, um, my inclination would be to recommend that that not be a ground-centric approach um, with many troops who cost you a lot of money and a lot of capital, political capital, to station for extended periods of time in another country. The mood has changed, I agree, but it could change back very quickly. Okay, so, so we need to think about how we would do this um, at, at strategic depth, mm -hmm. rather than tactically. And our strong suit, um, and weak suit, strong suit is that we can all agree on tactics. We rarely agree on strategy. And so we'll come up with a great tactic to do a delay. Having that connect to a diplomatic strategy is much harder. Okay. 
Uh, Dov, do you see Iran uh, coming to the table? I mean, the whole logic of the, you do see Iran coming to the table under, uh, under the Trump administration? Under any administration. Uh, my sense is Iran will come to the table, if nothing else, to extend the timelines <coughs> and to start to find a way to at least mitigate a path towards mitigation of the uh, sanctions. Okay. But it also is against, in their longer term strategy, it is extending the timeline for their, to mature their intellectual property associated with nuclear weapons. But why they haven't come yet to the table? It's no very need to. There's not really been a need to. But sanctions? Sanctions are just now starting to be so onerous that they are feeling backlash internally. So the military escalation has begun. Mm. This is the time to now start to do it. Now, the time, the exact timing, will be when Iran believes that they will be negotiating from a position of strength. Mm. Uh, do you agree, Dov? And, and uh, I want to ask you also, can Israel live with a, a nuclear-armed Iran? OK, on the first part, don't entirely agree. Um, Iran. I don't know how Iran gets a position of strength. Let's start with that. I know what you said, but it, it is a little bit remote, you have to admit. Now, most people believe that they came to the JCPOA table from precisely because of their position of weakness. Uh, and you've got to remember, we may not be the same hyperpower, to use the French term, that we once were, with one exception, and that's finances. And that's why we're killing these folks. Killing in quotes, I mean, we're not really. We're squeezing them in a way that no one else can and in a way that no one else can block. That's why Instex has failed. Yes, they're doing business with India, they're doing business with China, with Russia, but that's not preventing the decline in the economy that's starting to choke them. And the real issue is, in my view, and then I'll answer your Israel question, you got to still give them something to save face. And the reason I say that is because look at the siege of Leningrad, the siege of Stalingrad, Germans in 1944. People will starve rather than cave. And the Iranians are a proud people with a long history. They're an empire. They were there when nobody had ever heard of, of the New World. Um, and so they're just not going to cave. They need something to save face. What that something is, is a very tough call. Mm. Because it's, it's going back to the JCPOA, I don't think it's going to happen anyway. There too, too much has gone on beyond that, particularly what they've done in the rest of the Middle East. It'd be extremely difficult, not just for us, but even for the Russians, to say, OK, we're going to ignore all that's just happened. It, it, it won't work. So and even if a Democrat, say, wins in November 2020, then yeah, I think the I think the realities are such that you know. I mean, look, there are Democrats that have a Green New Deal as well. I mean, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Uh, and so the realities make it that you'll have to have some kind of twist to the JCPOA. Mm. But again, to have that twist, you've got to give something to the Iranians. And that's a very tough call, because the best thing we can give them is easing sanctions, which is precisely why we drive them to the table. So there'll have to be some kind of give and take. They're, very, they're the best negotiators around. How about a Pompeo trip to, to Tehran that he's been? Uh, so he'll come. Everybody knows that the real person who, who wants to make the trip to, is the president. And, but the president, it's interesting. Who does he want to talk to? He doesn't want to talk to the president of Iran. He wants to talk to the supreme leader because Mr. Trump thinks he's the supreme leader. <laughs> okay. And the supreme leader is not ready to talk to Mr. Trump, who's only a president. OK? Um, on Israel, um, the Israelis, like I said, I, first of all, the Israelis know that their defenses are pretty good. Um, could they live with a nuclear Iran? Probably not. Um, probably because they are so committed to preventing that. No Israeli prime minister could survive politically uh, by allowing a, a nuclear Iran. Now, 
Could they find a way around it? Could there be something peaceful? Yeah, of course. They were ready to tolerate the Shah's program, for God's sake. They were close to the Shah. Mm. So there are ways around it. Um, but an out-and-out -out nuclear program, uh, I highly doubt, for internal political reasons. Remember also, the Israeli public is far more right-wing today than it's ever been. And, and those guys uh, will vote out anybody that even muses about a nuclear Iran, much less says they'll accept it. So again, I think there'll have to be some way of finding a modus vivendi. And that probably means, probably not the Ayatollahs. I mean, if Qasem Soleimani or someone else in the IRGC takes the country over, and there's a lot of speculation about that after Khamenei, uh, those guys aren't religiously motivated. They're, they're pure politics, military power. Well, that's something the Israelis understand and can work with. But while we're on Israel, before I turn to Ali, General, do you think Israel has the military capability to, to strike Iran, to prevent Iran from uh, you know, some of these deep facilities, to prevent Iran from uh, getting a nuclear weapon? They have the capability to delay, not prevent. To delay, not to. I agree with that. They, first of all, even with their intelligence, nobody really knows where all of Iran's secret facilities are. That's number one. Number two is um, an American strike would tax our Air Force. Their Air Force is smaller. Mm. Number three is that when you go in, and you're, the, you're the, the pilot, but there's a thing called battle damage assessment. You want to know if you actually did what you thought you were going to do, which means you may have to come back. Mm. I don't know that the Israelis have that capability. Okay. Um, Ali, let's say, you know, uh, the Gulf wakes up one morning and the headline is Pompeo and Tehran. Uh, how would that be received? How does the Gulf now view, uh, you know, any potential of U.S.-Iran uh, talks, bilateral, not, not, not a, uh, you know, larger? Look, I mean, we just we, if I take a step back, the fundamental problem is how you see Iran. Mm. And there, there are two different points of view. There is a dominant view in America, really, among, uh, among elites, is that Iran is at, you know, in its core, a rational actor, and that it will behave rationally, um, and that it, it wants to build its country and its economic uh, potential, et cetera, et cetera, and that it has legitimate, I mean, the Iranians have been very clever in, in sort of, uh, spreading their, the, the, the story that they have legitimate security concerns in Lebanon, you know, uh, or in, in, in Yemen, uh, that that's their strategic death, so, so to speak. And it amuses me how many people take that seriously. Um, now, people in the Gulf and in Saudi Arabia, they don't look at what Iran says. They look at what Iran has done, and as a revolution, Iran has spent a disproportionate amount of its income, of its GDP, on projecting power externally. This is when its people suffer, medicines are in short supply, etc., etc., etc. So 40 years into the revolution, this is not a country that is pushing itself up the human development index. This is not something that their whole objective is spreading the revolution and dominating the region. As a result, the, you know, the feeling is that the Iranians use agreements, uh, meetings, um, as, uh, as, as, as a false um, game mm. where, where, they, where they can delay, where they can um, cloud people's judgment, where they can uh, insinuate that they want, that they want peace. And people, and the feeling was that the Obama administration got taken um, on that. Um, and as a result, I don't think, you know, everybody understands domestic pol U.S. political considerations, and, and the Iranians understand it too. And I think that the, the Iranians, um, like any theocracy also, they have strategic patience. And everybody knows that America, as a, as a system, has polit is political ADD. I mean, America has a very short attention span and a very short uh, willingness to, uh, to focus on something. 
So um, it is worrying. I mean, one never knows. You know, Mr. Pompeo went to Tehran. Uh, I think. I think there's a lot of confidence in Mr. Pompeo and the team around it, even in the president and his deep gut in the way that, I mean, nobody sees that this administration is looking at Iran with rose-tinted glasses like the previous administration was. But do you see, I mean, I, I see your point you're saying of under the Obama administration, Iran had, uh, you know, it had, had the capability to spread its proxies across the region. <coughs> At the same time, you look today, has much changed? Has really much changed? I mean, you still see uh, footage of Qasem Soleimani coming from uh, Iraq. Uh, Assad has uh, expanded his, his reach in, in Syria. Uh, in Yemen, we're seeing more drone attacks come at, at Saudi Arabia. So aside from sanctions, do you, would you say that regionally the uh, the, the logic here, the U.S. strategy, has weakened Iran? Well, the JCPOA strengthened Iran. You see, that was the issue. Because the JCPOA, uh, and not just that, the Iranians took advantage of the period during the negotiation of the JCPOA, when the, when the Obama administration was very sensitive to them. And the whole story that the, the song and dance that, that Mr. Zarif was playing was, you know, don't embarrass the president and myself. We're the moderates. You know, don't do anything that could em empower the the the, um, the radicals against us. And people bought that. Uh, so Iran has been moving forward, and Iran has been developing its external capabilities, and uh, it is a stronger ca power today. Uh, but uh, what does that mean? Does that mean that you give up and let them and let them roll over the Gulf? Because that essentially they view that America is on its way out. And they see a golden opportunity to become the hegemon uh, of the Gulf. And what that means is that by coercion, uh, they want to collect economic benefits uh, from being the hegemon of the Gulf. Because that's the only way they're going to be able to feed their people. These people don't know how to run an economy, you see. Like all, look at the Bolshevik Revolution. Look at that. Revolutions don't know how to run uh, run economies. And Iran is a statist, mismanaged, corrupt, um, misallocated, in, misallocating in resources economy. So the fear is that their only trump card for the revolution to survive is to become a regional hegemon and replace America, and that America is going to lose its interest. Um, and for them, a nuclear weapon will be the ultimate security card. And, and I don't think for Which a minute anybody in the Gulf. To today than I, they were under sorry, the just deal. like I said, yeah. I don't think for a minute anybody in, in Saudi Arabia believed that Iran really had stopped its nuclear program. I don't think they believed them. I think that 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 the, that the Iranians, you know, uh, would have found a way to continue and maintain um, and essentially play America. Okay, I mean, but, but, but would, you would agree that Iran is today closer to a nuclear weapon than it was in, uh, under the nuclear deal? Could we don't I mean, know that. We don't, I, I, you see, we, we now, they, remember the nuclear deal had, had, had the sunset clause also. So, and factually, and it did not destroy the you know, key elements, it did not destroy Fordo. I mean, they, they, you know, it was, it, everything was mothballed, right? So this was not something where you go in and uh, it's, it's a bit like, you know, the cocaine cartels in Colombia. You come in and you wipe out one field and then the, the, the federales leave and 10 fields come up tomorrow. So I don't think that, that ultimately Iran is hell-bent on having a nuclear weapon. And, and, I, and, and they understand, and they can look at Korea, and they can look at Qazafi, uh, that for that sort of a regime, um, that is essential. Mm. And... Uh, and I, they, I don't think they would negotiate that away uh, under any circumstance. General, you're nodding. Do, do you agree? I, th I mean, I think that from the Iranian perspective, you're, you're correct. Um, I think the JCPOA, um, that they took advantage of it, um, the seams and the opportunities that were not addressed in the JCPOA. Like what? Um, well, their ability to grow their um, regional forces and, and uh, terrorism and export goods, uh, weapons and whatnot. But 
but by the same token, we gained in that activity because we were able to, one, understand what was going on, two, most importantly, get the IAEA in there to do assessments that were credible so that we would understand the adversary and not do something out of making something 10 foot tall that wasn't or not discover something 10 foot tall that was. And so the JCPOA gave us good delay activities. I don't for a moment believe that the Iranians stopped. Certainly they did not get rid of their growth of intellectual property and capital. Um, a generation has essentially gone by and they have basically been able to cha train that generation. So, because their scientists were aging out. That was one of the things that everybody was worried about. So my sense is you know, that, that I agree with you from the standpoint that Iran has taken advantage of it. Okay. And it's gonna make any negotiation more difficult. Um, I think that, uh, this is my personal opinion, that uh, the move to move up to the brink of conducting a direct a attack on Iran and then pulling back at the last moment established one thing, that the president is the negotiator. Not the Defense Department, not our military, not our State Department, the president is, and, as, as Dove said. And so we're kind of in that position. You cannot bomb away intellectual capital. You cannot bomb away, away the option of nuclear. That just can't, mm -hmm. that, that's not successful. So could uh, Israel win in something like that? Not militarily, but military with diplomacy? Who knows? I mean, you could find an agreement at some point in the future where the inevitable had to be addressed. Okay. And so I wouldn't foreclose an agreement that occurs, but it would be a strange one. It would be a strange one for us sitting here today to see. But I, would I would it? Like yeah. Go ahead. A couple of things. First, the IAEA never got access to military facilities, which means that all kinds of stuff was going on there, and I suspect that's where, like Ali says, they continued to do what they were doing. Second of all, they said, right, we've gone from 3.7% to 5%. They've told us that. So, how do we really know? But the IAEA inspectors did go and they... But they don't go to the military facilities, mm -hmm. in which case it might be more than 5%. Now, to say that, you know, there's an argument that I've seen recently that said, well, you know, why, why did we take it out on the JCPOA, which did not address their regional behavior or, for instance, their missile development? Well, the answer is, it should have. And it did give them a huge opening, which they've exploited, uh, to essentially solidify their situation in Syria. What checks them in Syria, of course, is the Russians. The Russians, you know, for instance, the Russians have two air, uh, an air base and naval facility in Syria that with, with a 99-year lease. The Iranians don't. The Russians basically still train the Syrian army. The Iranians are trying to but they're Russians trying to keep them out. So that checks them there. In, a, in, in Yemen, they've done what they can. Um, but the UAE is stronger in South Yemen, and so that checks them for a very different reason than, say, the Saudis with their, with their uh, direct attacks and bombs and so on. But the Iranians have been pushing even further because the, I, the JCPOA didn't address the issue. But on Syria, I mean, the, the Iranian, you, you said it, with Russia's help, with Russia intervening directly uh, to uh, boost Bashar al-Assad, uh, nuclear deal or not, we might have still ended where we are uh, today. So why do you fold the nuclear deal for Iran expanding in Syria when the intervention, Iranian intervention in Syria started, you know, way before, three years, 2012? Well, the, the question is, would... Uh, Iran have done as well as it had in Syria? Would Iran have supported the Houthis to the extent it has? Um, Yemen is a clear example of where Iran ratcheted up its support. Um, and so, you know, you can say, yes, with the, the JCPOA didn't need to address it. The Iranians would have gone ahead anyway, but allowing the Iranians that much more money in order to provide funding for Hezbollah, for the, uh, the, the, those they support in Syria, for the Houthis and so on, 
I mean, clearly that was a mistake. The last thing you want to do is allow them to expand or even just maintain their position. The whole idea was to restrict them. That it didn't do. Uh, Ali, if, uh, uh, let's say, negotiations start with Iran, would the Gulf want to be uh, on the <coughs> table? And what would they be looking for? Would Saudi Arabia would want to be on the table? What would they be looking for? in a new uh, deal? Certainly they'd want to be on the table, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the big issues with the Obama administration was mm -hmm. that it had kept its allies in the dark. Uh, yet it was talking to their most um, frightening enemy uh, in the region. So, so they would certainly like to be involved. Uh, look, I mean, again, there, there are tactical things. Can you get the Iranians to withdraw from Yemen or reduce their exposure to Yemen? That would certainly be, be helpful. But again, there is a miss, you know, miss, uh, there's a difference of vision about how people see, in Saudi Arabia, see the Iranian involvement in Yemen and how people in Washington see it. People in Washington think that this is a low cost way to irritate Saudi Arabia and that that's why the Iranians are there. In Saudi Arabia, people look at Iran in Yemen as a long term strategic play where Iran sees it as a soft belly of Saudi Arabia and this is part of the, its long-term plan to become the hegemon in the Gulf. Uh, so would you get some tactical benefits to get the Iranians out that might um, you know, improve your position on the ground in the future? Sure. Um, I think so. So I mean, and, and look, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries will, will, will want to play along with the Trump administration also and will not want to be spoilers. Uh, but when you look at Yemen, I mean, what is the exit strategy? The political, uh, the Stockholm process is uh, stagnant. There hasn't been any uh, Well, any look, what, pe what people forget about Yemen is that actually the Saudi government has been actively pursuing a political route and supported Stockholm. In fact, the Crown Prince got personally involved in keep and, and in pushing the Yemeni government to, to, to take an active role in Stockholm. The problem is, like you had in Lebanon in the Civil War, once militias develop and they have arms and they have access to rent seeking, they control ports, they control customs, they control central banks, they have acquired power in the country that they don't want to give up. So the, the, ultimately, the Houthis are blocking a solution because a solution as per the UN uh, Security Council will turn them all into, you know, members of parliament with nothing else and going from being warlords, uh, w driving, you know, being the, probably the dominant party in the country and, and having access to, you know, domestic economic and even foreign economic uh, support from people who dislike Saudi Arabia. Uh, do they want to convert? and become, the only reason the Lebanese civil war was, was crushed was because a hegemon came in like Syria and crushed all the others. And it still kept Hezbollah. So I think what people do not realize is that Saudi Arabia and the UAE have been very actively pushing for a political solution for a while. So they are not the ones that are holding it up, but, but it is not in the interests of the Houthis to have a political solution. And that's, again, something that people do not recognize uh, or do not want to recognize. Even with the UAE redeploying now, do you think uh, the, the Saudi game, the Saudi rationale should stay the same? And well, Yemen Saudi Arabia, first of all, Saudi Arabia has come up the learning curve in, in three years of fighting, right? Uh, the Saudi military was a military that never fought a real war before. Uh, and so it has learned a lot. It has made its mistakes. It's gone up the learning curve. Um, so that's one benefit to Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia really had two un unannounced strategic objectives at the beginning of the war. One was, you know, when, when the Houthis took over Sana'a, an air bridge developed between Iran and Sana'a, and there were, I don't know, 18 flights a week. Um, uh, and, you know, there's no tourist traffic from Iran coming to, to, to Sana'a. Uh, the only reason for that air bridge was, was military support. So the nightmare was that the Houthis have taken over Sana'a and now the Houthis will have two, three, four, five years of peace uh, to build with the Iranians a Hezbollah-like structure in the north of Yemen. So the primary objective of the war was to hit ports and airports and close that down and force the Iranians from an open air bridge 
into having to smuggle uh, weapons through small boats and through the Omani border. And that has been achieved. The second objective was to send a message to the Houthis that if you think we will allow you peace and quiet while you work with the Iranians to build another Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, you've you have something else coming. And that has also been achieved because they have, the Houthis have paid a very heavy price. Now, there's been a huge political price for Saudi Arabia, partially because I think a lot of the public relations um, has been mismanaged from the beginning. The story was not well said. Uh, and war is dirty, you know. I mean, there's this illusion among Western elites that you can have a clean war. Nobody talks about what went on in Mosul or you know, what went on in Raqqa. You know, everybody talks about hospitals that Saudis hit. There was a hospital, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, that the Americans hit in Afghanistan with helicopters and planes and it had all the signs and it went on for, you know, militaries make such mistakes. But, but they unfortunately... Are, they are mistakes and they are costly humanitarian of course, tragedies. Of yeah. course, well, I mean, yes, but that's, that, that is the dirty side of war, you see. At the end of the day, you know, America liberated Raqqa, America flattened Raqqa, you see. Uh, and I've spoken to members of the American military who told me, you know, because the, the, in, the, in the fight for Mosul, using, uh, using Iraqi forces who themselves were scared and didn't, didn't want to come in, they'd identify one terrorist ISIS person in a building, and the building might have 20 civilians, and then they'd call in an American airstrike and they'd drop a 200 pound bomb on that building. So, unfortunately, you know, war is, 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 is there, there's, there's never is a clean war and civilians always pay a price. So, and that is, a, that is, a, that is very unfortunate and that's something that, I mean, I visited the, 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 the targeting center in Riyadh and, and, and met with, with Firas and, and, and some people actually just a few months ago and met the team that, that, that works on that. They're making, and there were, uh, there were British and American officers in that room helping them. Uh, in terms of identifying every potential, um, you know, do not bomb site in Yemen. They're trying, uh, but, you know, this is, this is war, unfortunately. Uh, if I want to go back to what's happening, you know, with Iran in, in, in the Gulf waters, uh, the U.S. is working um, toward a uh, maritime coalition. Uh, the U.K. is also uh, in talks with uh, uh, some Europeans, uh, Mark Asper, will be in, in CENTCOM uh, this week to, to uh, advance these talks. But, uh, I mean, do you see this general as enough of a deterrent for Iran if more ships move, uh, move into, uh, into, into the region to, to, escort, uh, to escort the traffic? Uh, and the flip side of it, wouldn't that be inviting Russia and China to, to be part of the naval presence in, in the Gulf? Um, the idea of a coalition um, is a, a construct of economy of force and an economy of a common uh, end state uh, uh, objective. And obviously that is preferred over X number of actors all on their own with all different agendas and different methodologies going into the same problem in the same space. So um, CENTCOM will certainly want to have a coalition, and we've been successful in the past building coalitions to include with the Chinese and the Russians associated with piracy and things like that. So it's, it's all possible. All of the parties have interests, but right now those interests are not sufficiently aligned to have an expectation, at least in the next couple of meetings, that they're going to come together as a coalition. It'll take time to do that. To the extent that it becomes a, um, a deterrent yeah. to um, Iran, um, I think Iran will look at it as a successful cost imposition to the adversary. In other words, they're making them, where they're making all of the adversaries now rally forces, move them into the theater, put them at risk in the theater, um, and pay for that presence in a very hefty price. And, and how long can they nibble at probing um, small actions to keep those people there and tied up? Mm. I don't think they look at them as a, 
okay, this is a potential that overnight it could swing to an attack on us, quite frankly, right now, because that, that coalition is too fractured that way. It would almost be a promise up front that this is not a coalition to attack. I mean, that would be any number of countries predicate to going into the conversation. So I don't see it as a, as a significant deterrent. Um, it's just a price. And they weighed that price and the imposition of cost on the allies, so to speak, the coalition, would be higher than the imposition of cost on the Iranians. I'm not even sure that they would stop their attacks. Um, in fact, if you look at what happened with the UK, there was a destroyer there. The destroyer told them to stop. So they didn't. And so that's another element of it. They may not stop anyway because not all the members of the coalition will necessarily, I mean, look at our experience in Afghanistan and, and in Iraq. Yes, we had a coalition, but that didn't mean they all responded the same way to attacks. So that's number one. Number two is, it's not clear to me, certainly in the case of the Chinese, probably the Russians, and maybe even some of the Europeans, that they would do this unless there's a Security Council resolution. And I would not bet the family farm on a Security Council resolution. So you've got a number of factors here which kind of uh, weaken the power of this argument that, yeah, we'll put together this coalition, this great fleet. It's one thing to fight a bunch of Somali pirates. It's quite another thing to take on Iran. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about sanctions, uh, you know, the impact of, of sanctions on Iran, I mean, if the U.S. imposes more, uh, more sanctions, uh, do you see any threat to the regime to crack internally? How do you view the situation well, I, I, inside I think Iran? that there are people in this town who think mm -hmm. that's the out outcome. But it, that's not how it works. I mean, that's not how Saddam Hussein left. It took a war to get him out, even though we had sanctions going on from 1991. So uh, I, you know, sanctions can work for certain limited purposes. They worked against South Africa in a certain way. But when, you, when you're basically uh, seen by the entire population as, as strangling them, you're first of all uniting what's still an empire. What's the definition of an empire? An empire is different ethnic groups all living under one ethnic group's control. That's what Iran is. You've got Azeris, you've got Baluchis, you've got all kinds of people there, right? Um, this, they will hold out. Now, they may come to the, the bargaining table, but they will come to the table as a regime. I don't see the regime falling because of this. And, and I think the people who think that sanctions bring down regimes, um, you know, the exceptions prove the rule. They don't. Ali, do you agree? Look, I, I don't think anybody has uh, an expectation that sanctions will bring down the regime. What sanctions do is starve the regime of resources, and then they have less resources to project power across the region, you see. Um, and, and sanctions cause, you know, Iran has had its share of demonstrations. So it, uh, people start to demand. People have been going in the streets and saying, what do we have to do with Lebanon? What do we have to do with Syria? What do we have to do with Yemen? You know, we want, you know, we want food. So, sh so sanctions put more pressure on the government, uh, uh, which is what, what you want, which is the objective, really. Uh, not so much, you want behavioral change. You know, regime change does not come uh, we all know that very easily under any circumstance. But how do you view Iran today, you know, with, with Khamenei's age, with, you, you already see divisions within uh, the establishment. Uh, do, you, do you see this as the post-Khamenei battle, political battle starting in Iran? What, what, where do you see it? Are you uh, asking me? Uh, either. Well, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, look, Iran is a country dominated by the supreme leader and the clerics around him, his, 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 his base, and the Revolutionary Guard, which the regime has spent 40 years indoctrinating, right? This is a, this is a communist party on steroids, right? Uh, so this whole song and dance that, that Mr. Zarif has been selling us about moderates and radicals as if he's the, he and Rouhani are the Gorbachevs and, and, and you know, the supreme leader is, is an ailing Brezhnev. In our view, it's bullshit. 
okay? Uh, and uh, uh, so the Revolutionary Guard is again an ideological, uh, built on a theocratic view and an ideological view of the region. And we don't think that, um, you know, Mr. Khamenei is going to be uh, succeeded by Florence Nightingale, you see. So the same thing will be perpetuated. And, um, and uh, this whole issue of trying to, of Kremlin watching, of pretending that there is this push and pull. There are, so of course, there's squabbles between elites. Elites squabble the whole time and disagree the whole time and compete the whole time. And that is what politics is in Iran. But there's not a fundamental plurality where you have, you know, the Democrats on one side and the theocratic uh, theocrats on the other, in, in our view. I have a slightly different take. I, I don't disagree um, about moderates versus radicals or hardliners. I think there are hardliners and then there are more hardliners. And um, I'm not sure that if the IRGC took over, and remember, look at the control they have over the economy, not just they've got the guns, they control over the economy. I don't know that they would pursue a quote unquote theoratic, theocratic approach, mm. but I don't see any modification to Iran's behavior. I mean, these are the guys that are in all those countries you mentioned. These are the guys that are doing the training you're, of Hezbollah. You're, you're forgetting that the Revolutionary Guard benefits from the theocratic approach because using theocracy and using their ideology, they are able to indoctrinate adherents. I mean, how are they spreading in southern Latin. Lebanon? How are they spreading among the Shia in Iraq? Even how are they spreading among, among the Shia uh, uh, or the Zaydis in, in, in Yemen? It, there's an ideology there, you see, and an ideology helps. Well, but y again... But they're uh, also with Hamas, with, with, with yeah, some Yeah, they're, they're working with Hamas. No, yeah, but they're, they're working with, I mean, the, 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 the Israelis, the, the Iranians use the, the Palestinian issue as, a, as a blatantly, as a, as a, as a uh, let's capture Sunni market share strategy. Look, my, my uh, point and, is, and my, my point you know, is it's simply, blatant, really. My point is simply this. Uh, right now, it suits them to use theocratic means. There's no question. That doesn't mean that if they took over, they would continue to, pers to pursue it the I would, same way. Why would they throw it away when it's so useful to them? If they found something better. Who no. knows? I mean, well, the their model has worked. Look, so the, far. the Iranians have been hegemonic, as you say, for a very long time. No, they haven't. You know, this, this whole story, by oh, the way. Oh, the Shah was not? No, no. Let me tell you something. This whole tell story. That, tell that to Mohammed bin Zayed that the Shah yeah. wasn't. No, the Shah. We may have no, no, to. No, no, I'm sorry. We have to start okay, the Q&A. Okay, but the Shah, the Shah was not a hegemon because America was there and Britain was there. And even he tried when Britain left, but America came in. <laughs> and America constrained him. But the, the point is their impulses are what they've been. And, and that's not going to change. The well, vehicles and, but, but, but change. But you have to deal impulses. with them. And that's why they're threatening. Oh, I don't question that. We will move to uh, Q&A at, uh, at this time. If you have a question, please identify yourself. Have a question. Uh, and if you want to address it to any of the panelists, please mention uh, What's uh, his What's plan name. B? You plan said you're moving to plan A. What's plan B? There is no plan B in this town. That's the yeah, story of this city. There is no plan There's B. No plan okay, B. we're going to go uh, over here. Um, hi, Hani. Um, my question is to Ali. So um, you've been talking about how the Saudis and the Emirates have been supporting sanctions and you know maximum pressure. But I look at the United Arab Emirates and I see that there is still nine billion dollars in bilateral trade happening. So what about that? Um, the, okay. the Iranians are capable on, and this is the second question on, because you said that the Iranians are not, they don't know how to run an economy. And um, I think of them as being really capable of running a, an economy because despite of all these you know, sanctions, they still are able to operate. They have launched their, you know, um, Muhajir 6 recently drone, and they're still, you know, operating at a very effectively. So what do you say about that? Okay, let me start with that. Uh, they have, they have uh, devoted the majority of their effort and resources on the military space, you see? So yes, they have launched the Muhajir 6, and they have launched it, that, and, you know, that they're going to become a nuclear power, so yes. <laughs> They've put, they, they haven't turned Tehran into a startup city. They haven't launched a new iPhone. They haven't gone uh, after anything. What they have focused on is offensive and defensive, but military weapons. So that's number one. What was your first question? I 
was about the United Emirates. You know, yes, uh, trade but, yeah, the, UN, the UAE trade, because the UAE, and this is in accommodation to Dubai. You know, there are internal politics within the UAE, and, and, and Dubai, frankly, its business model early on was built on trade with Iran. And it has a very strong Iranian trading community. Now, there's been a lot of pressure put on, first by the Americans, then by Abu Dhabi on Dubai. So that, a lot of that has been reduced. But still, uh, I think America understands and Abu Dhabi understands that, that for Dubai's, um, and I think Dubai has a different political objective also. They're much more conciliatory and they want to work uh, you know, to them. To them um, their approach to Iran is a little bit different. So that's where you get that figure of, of, of trade between the UAE and, uh, and Iran. Great, we're gonna go here, the lady in the blue shirt. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Sylwia Szablowska. I'm an assistant defense attaché at the Polish embassy. So two quick questions. First, uh, regarding Europe. Uh, you know, your, most European countries are not happy, at least, with the uh, current administration policy towards Iran and what's happening. So what, you know, your recommendation is for Europe, or what role it can play to, um, uh, you know, to, to try to be active uh, and uh, in this what's happening towards Iran and uh, and calm down perhaps pressure. That's the first question. Second, very quick, Turkey. Uh, what do you reckon what's happening around Turkey internally and externally with the U.S. relations? What role can Turkey play in the region? Thank you. Turkey, we'll have to just limit it to Turkey within Iran uh, within development. Yeah. So, Dov, why don't you take Turkey uh, and then maybe the general can answer uh, recommendations for Europe? <laughs> okay. Easy. Um, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, on Turkey, I mean, clearly there are a couple of things going on that are almost self-contradictory. On the one hand, the, the S-400 mess uh, has shown Turkey moving away from the United States, clearly. And it has a, the Turks and the Iranians have a very interesting relationship since 1453, which is the peaceful coexistence may be a good way to put it. Um, and that still goes on. Uh, the, the flip side, though, is what just happened in the mayoral ele election in Istanbul, which is a completely different approach and isn't just a rejection, I think, of, of uh, Erdogan's policies in general, but also, I think, a much more pro-American approach as well. You remember, Istanbul is, you know, if the Russians ever got into the southern part of the Black Sea. I mean, who's vol who, who, what city have they try been trying to get for the last several hundred years? It's Istanbul. So they're much more sensitive, I think, to the Russian relationship on the one hand and to the American relationship on the other. But right now, Turkey's in a very uh, difficult position. We've threatened, I mean, the law is there. There are going to be sanctions on Turkey. And this is coming on top of a very uh, a weakened economy, as you know. The inflation's gone up. The value of the lira is going all the way down. Um, and so, and at the same time, the Turks keep talking about moving into Syria even further into Syria than they already are. So I, I would characterize the current Turkish situation as somewhat chaotic. You really don't know where they're going. Chaotic, I agree with. <laughs> um, the the European side of this equation, I think. The difficulty here is that um, the, the impact of, of um, where the Europeans have been thus far has really not changed anything in the, in the relationships, in, in deterrence, etc. And so whether you want to award style points or not, um, there was a very smart man in history that said, if you keep doing the same thing, expecting a different outcome. And so, you know, stirring this up to some extent and, and, and calling out the shortcomings in a provocative way has at least opened the door to um, something different. Um, the question here is that we all worry about is, you know, is the U are the U.S. and NATO or, or Europeans starting to separate um, in, in policy, in thought process, in lifestyle, et cetera? And I, I believe no, the answer is no there, but we're all going through changes in our society 
you know, for a lot of different reasons. Um, I think the, the, the relationships um, that are critical right now, from my perspective, in this discussion, mm -hmm. have more to do with Romania and Poland than they do with um, Turkey. But Turkey, at some point, is the epicenter <laughs> you know, of the beginning of civilization for, for a reason. A lot of things come together at Turkey, geographically, economically, et cetera. And to lose Turkey in this discussion or to lose patience with Turkey in this discussion would be to our, our demise, our, our, our uh, disadvantage. We have to pay attention there. The Europeans have to pay attention. We have to find a way to come to, to agreement on the issues in the Gulf and the issues associated with the perimeter of, of uh, Russia, et cetera. And we have not found a way to have that conversation yet. And uh, you know, people are going to not like this statement, but the old ways and the old relationships have to find a way to a new footing. And, and just anchoring it in, let's all agree on the same thing for a problem, just really never gets us quite where we want to go. And it's, it's, it's starting to wear thin right now. What does that look like? What does a new relationship with, with all of these countries that have been allies for so many years look like? I don't know, Brexit's in there, um, you know, cyber's in there. I mean, these, this is a different game. We have to figure out how to cherry pick what, what still works, but then find common footing in areas that we don't have a good dialogue on right now. We could use another panel on Turkey, but not today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're going to go here, and then we're going to go to the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, Piotr from the country once known as the UK. Um, <laughs> um, at least in a few months, I think. But um, yeah, I um, last year I took a class with uh, Professor Adam Susbin, who was one of the leading individuals for negotiating the G, uh, JPCOA. And uh, it was all about sanctions, and we've discussed it here. Sanctions are about behavioral change. But when you begin to impose increasing amounts of sanctions to the point where the behavioral change is becoming more aggressive with Iran, th I don't think it's the right answer to do. I'm not saying I have the right answer, but what I'm disturbed by is the lack of uh, cohesion between Europe and the US. The ally system is the fundamental strength that the United States has. So my question is basically, how much is the United States shooting itself in the foot, uh, at least in the short term, with continually pursuing pressure and not seeking to perhaps communicate better with, with the, I mean, Britain's not helping either, but yeah, yeah. what can we do to, to shift the rhetoric at least? I'll let my economists jump in, <laughs> but first, I mean, okay. like anything else, when you start to take something to the extreme, the coalition will start to fall apart because because the cost imposed on, on you know on others, the second and third order effects so to speak, become so onerous that they're not sustainable, and you know you're you're playing this game to get the maximum leverage on on an adversary, but the imposition that's occurring to all of the parties that are playing are is is not even. And it's going to be difficult to sustain this kind of activity. It's one thing to say I'm going to ratchet it up. It's another thing to understand, you know, you pick it. Um, what country has been disadvantaged by this? What economies are being disadvantaged by this? It's a two-way street on a lot of these things. I would, I would simply say this. If we really wanted the Europeans to be on board uh, with what we're doing with Iran or trying to do, then we shouldn't be beating them up at the same time. Uh, which is what we're doing economically. I mean, the president's threats about cars, about aluminum, about this, about that. About wine. Wine. Uh, uh, wine, which really bothers a lot of people. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help to unify uh, the allies uh, around uh, doing anything economically with Iran. I mean, we should be doing exactly the opposite. We should be thinking of, okay, if we're going to interrupt European business with Iran, how do we compensate the Europeans for the business they've lost? That's what we should be doing. But, you know, uh, I would be the last one to argue that we pursue a coherent policy. We're going to go to the back, the gentleman with the orange tie and the glasses, yeah. Hi, I'm Mark Cadell with Chevron Corporation. Uh, this question is for Ali. Um, on the cyber front, the general mentioned cyber, and I've been waiting to hear about um, 
this as a component of Iran's asymmetric uh, response to pressure or its its ability to reach out and hurt people. How, uh, I guess, palpable is the Iranian cyber threat in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states? Well, I mean, there, there was a live example, right, a, a, a few years ago when they mounted a cyber attack against the oil company, Aramco. So yes, it, it, it's a very high priority issue. Resources are being poured in, and I mean, America cooperates, and, and, and there's assistance from outside powers. But certainly, everybody realizes that that's part of the Iranian menu uh, of, of tools that they will use. And, uh, and you know, all efforts are being made to be prepared for that. Uh, do you see, Ali, that th there has been any new security measures following the, the escalation, whether in Saudi or, or UAE, preventative? Like Certainly. I mean, they're, they're, they're much more uh, co uh, cognizant of, of the drone uh, strikes. They've been, they've been shooting down many more drones. Obviously, there, there's, there are, uh, you know, a few more eyeballs on the Iraqi border now than there were before. Um, uh, so in that sense, yes. I mean, I think, I think the whole, uh, you know, uh, the, the whole oil, oil sector since the early 80s has, has lived un under a security environment. But that certainly is, is at, at, at its reddest level, if you want. OK. Uh, we're going to go to the uh, lady in the last seat. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bria. I'm with Arab Gulf States Institute. Um, I wanted to know um, kind of some of your feedback and some recommendations that you had on um, the state of Qatar and the kind of the crisis that's going on with the GCC. Do you think that um, it will dissolve kind of what's happening right now or would it strengthen Qatar's relation with Iran? Mm. Very interesting uh, question. So the, the GCC rift, the Qatar crisis, uh, how is it impacting the, the standoff and Gulf unity with, when it comes to Iran? Well, I mean, it's impacting mm -hmm. Gulf unity, but it's not really having an other major impact beyond that. And look, the Qatar crisis is a family fight. U ultimately, it'll, it'll be sorted out, I think. But uh, it's not. It, 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 fundamentally, it never, from day one, it was very made very clear to the Americans that that, that, that will never affect, that the, the blockade of Qatar will not have any impact on, on America's capacity to operate uh, across the Gulf out of Erdaid, and on the Qataris' capacity to operate in joint military maneuvers. And in fact, the Qataris have been invited to all GCC military meetings. So I think there's been a conscious effort to um, separate that. But is Qatar moving closer to Iran? Look, you're, you're prisoners of your geography. So Qatar can move closer to anybody it likes, but Qatar's stuck to Saudi Arabia, you see. So at the end of the day, um, uh, you know, it, as I said, it's a family fight, and, and, and I expect it over time to, to get sorted out. But they have, you are a prisoner of your geography, and, and, uh, and you're going to have to deal with that. You just have no choice. OK, we're going to go here. Dave Onsbach, no affiliation. Uh, just throwing this out there. Expo 2020, the World Expo, is going to be next year in Dubai, which is, of course, right between Saudi Arabia and Iran and only about 120 kilometers where, where they've had those skirmishes with the tankers. So I'm just trying to figure out whether that has anything to do with any, with any peace in the area or anything like that. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just throwing, it, throwing that out there. I don't think so. Huh? All right. Never mind. Thank okay. You. We're going to go over here. Hi, I'm Yara Asmar, and I come from Lebanon, and I'm a researcher on Iran um, opposition and social movements. I just have a question for all our panelists. What is requested from Iran at this point? Uh, Mr. Ali, you talked about like KSA and UAE pushing for a political solution in Yemen, and never worked out. but. Uh, because it wasn't in the interest of the Houthis, but the Houthis were part of it. Like they were talked to in a way or another since they're Yemenis, like m most of them are Yemenis. In Lebanon, uh, Hezbollah, the strength of Hezbollah is not only f uh, because of the money that is coming from Iran. It's basically from the integration of Hezbollah in the society of Lebanon, from the uh, uh, like a strategic uh, Shiite uh, political engagement of, of Iran of uh, Hezbollah. 
the GCPOA gave kind of a framework for, for Iran uh, to like basically start communicating with the West. But now, I don't, I don't see like h how, how Iran will, will, will get over this, how, wha wha h how the Gulf will get over this, especially that there are no clear uh, requests from Iran at this point. Now so only pressure and sanctions. So what is needed Thank from Iran? We know what the, the maximalist position is of the administration. Administration has made that very, very clear. They, want, they, they, did, they got out of the JCPOA precisely because they felt that apart from the, the sunset provisions coming too soon, which they, was one argument, they felt that uh, Iran had, that the agreement had done nothing to stop Iran's pursuing its influence in the region in a very militaristic way. Uh, and third, that it had no uh, impact at all on Iran's development, the uh, missile development. So those are the three, th the three asks on the part of the administration. Obviously, that is the maximalist position. The minimalist position is let's go back to the JCPOA and everything will be fine and we're all happy again. Well, it's not going to be minimalist and most maximalists don't normally get what they want. And so it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Now. Given what you just said, well, you know, how do we ever envisage, envisage any kind of a, arrangement? Ask Mr. Kim Jong Un. Things, you know, people do things that no one expects. But what has he done? What has who done? Kim Jong Un. He's, of course, he's done nothing. That's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, if the Iranians want something to happen given that the United States tends to like to jump on opportunities like that, particularly this president, something might happen. All I'm saying is don't assume what the, the problem we always have, and we as Americans, but not just Americans, analysts in particular, we always straight line everything. Everything is, you know, what happened yesterday happens today, it must happen tomorrow. It never does. So the first thing you've got to do is stop straight lining, and then you begin to see that things could work out in some way that you totally didn't anticipate. Ali, would you like to add anything on Yemen? No, I mean, just Houthis. a question about the Houthis in Yemen. By the way, discussions with the Houthis have been going on continuously, even on an intelligence level, even, even when they were not meeting in Kuwait or in Stockholm. Uh, discussions have been going on with them um, uh, in the days of Ali Abdullah Saleh when he was their partner and even after that. So I, I don't, there's no lack of dialogue there. Um, and and Frankly, there is no lack of an interest by Saudi Arabia to bring this to a political solution. Um, but S Saudi Arabia is the one most acutely affected by what happens in northern Yemen. And it's easy for people to pontificate from you know, the, the ivory towers of the West and criticize. But they are not facing the threat that Saudis perceive themselves to be facing. We're going to go, uh, the gentleman here. Uh, thank you. I'm Dave Rubinowitz. I'm retired. Uh, it seems to be taken for granted that a nuclear weapon makes a country powerful. But it seems to me it turns it basically into a suicide bomber. They can do a lot of damage, but if they push the button, they're going to blow themselves up too. And I'm wondering, aside from the possibility of somebody transferring a nuclear weapon to a non-state uh, agent or something. Is nuclear weapons really that important? Well, they're a pretty good deterrent. Um, it's not clear that they'll help a North Korea if it got into a war, but it sure deters the United States and others from attacking North Korea. And it, in, as a deterrent, it, it's really quite effective. Now, you may not agree, but uh, evidently the North Koreans do. Uh, and um, that seems to be one of the motivators for the Iranians. The same thing. They believe it's a deterrent. The Israelis believe it's a deterrent. Gaddafi didn't believe it. And, Ka and Gaddafi and didn't believe it. And look what happened to Gaddafi. Uh, so um, no, it, you know, it's one thing to think about what it'll do for you in a nuclear war. It's another thing to think about whether this could, for example, deter a conventional attack. Most people think it will. Most governments think it will. Most governments that want nuclear weapons think it will. Uh, and by the way, 
I should have said this earlier on, I'm not speaking for CNA, I'm just speaking for Zakheim, but most of the governments that I've spoken to, uh, and I've been around, um, they all, whether they have nuclear weapons, want nuclear weapons, or don't care one way or another, they all agree that when you have a nuclear weapon, it gives you a deterrent that you otherwise would not have. Is it for Iran regime survival? Is it, is it uh, Well, I think the Iranian the regime, regime probably thinks that. Um, again, you know, the, the question really is, what is, do we want to get rid of the Iranian regime? You know, look, the Iranians know their history. Everybody in the Middle East knows history better than Americans. Um, they remember Mossadegh. And that, that was regime change, for goodness sake. That wasn't internal regime change. That was externally driven. That was Kermit Roosevelt and the Brits. Yeah. So, th of course they think about that. And if they think about that in the context of a nuclear weapon, you could see where they see it as a deterrent. Is it an effective deterrent? Up to now, most people believe it has been. Okay. Did you want to... Uh, yeah, my, my sense is, I mean, historically, nuclear weapons are a venue by guarantee to guarantee sovereignty, okay? I mean, that, that's essentially, the thing that has caused concern with the countries that we have addressed, North Korea, Iran, is that the transition from guarantor of sovereignty into maximum killing and, and devastation, um, which kind of moves towards the terrorism side of the use of the weapon, is what we're probably most worried about, and particularly the ability to export that to a third party. And those are the venues by which, as far as guaranteeing sovereignty, that's, that's really starting to wane. Now, people hate me when I say that, and I'm kind of controversial on that, but, but the, the, the sway power of a, of a pure deterrent is waning on electric, uh, just because there are so many other venues by which you can go after a society. Can I go? I'm a Peter Humphrey, an intel analyst and a former diplomat. Um, of the five things we've demanded, out of Yemen, out of Iraq, out of Syria, limit missiles and get rid of uh, nuclear aspirations, which one of those could Iran uh, concede so that uh, President Trump could declare victory, uh, cut some sanctions, and uh, bring, bring some of the forces home? My sense is that um, people think that the missiles are the con concession. Mm. I don't agree with that, um, mainly because uh, as a society, we are moving um, money, commerce, etc., is moving into um, venues that transmit information back and forth and money and transactions and whatnot without physical presence changing. Think cyber, think space. Okay, so if you're asking them to give up what is probably the most apparent opening in leverage to future society, I don't think they're going to be willing to do that. They're probably going to be willing to concede you know, with some sort of limitation on exporting stuff and then continue to do it anyway. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I just don't see any of those. I, I'm, I mean, yeah, and, and Dub's Syria right in that they'll, they'll address them, yeah. but the best they'll get out of it is a year's worth of negotiation that gets nothing. They're not, look, <laughs> if you actually disaggregate those five, you just heard about the missile thing. Yemen, I'm surprised you didn't say that, but the, Yemen is Saudi Arabia's nightmare for another reason. Yeah. If you've got the eastern province, which has been totally infiltrated by those guys, by the Iranians, and they've always, their nightmare is the pincer movement. So I don't know how quickly they give up, how the Iranians yeah. give up Yemen, because that's a sword that they hang over Saudi Arabia. Hezbollah, not easy to give up, that's, that's their showpiece. Syria, again, they, you know, they got in, they're not going to want to run out, and Iraq, certainly not. So I don't know what they would give up. I mean, again, really you know, we, we just cannot predict that it'll be circumstance-driven. 
Uh, I suspect that if there's any give on the part of Tehran, the Washington will pounce on it, and so will our allies. But what that specific is, it's not obvious to me at this moment. And isn't it more likely that the U.S. would leave Syria or Iraq before Iran, Iranian proxies do? I mean, well, the president has outlined. I, I think uh, on Syria, his his inclination. Well, look, on the Middle East, his inclination is very clear. There's right. no question. Um, for, on Iraq, he doesn't need to put that much in. Uh, Syria is just a lot more complex because the Israelis don't want us to walk out of Syria. So he's got that tie. And he doesn't want to give Syria over to the Russians. The Israelis will deal with the Russians and without us if they need to. Mm -hmm. um, but I think he'd be under a lot of domestic pressure not to walk away from Syria. Uh, question, the gentleman in the blue, everyone is wearing blue today, uh, <laughs> the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shabtai Gold. I'm a journalist. I just wanted to ask, because it wasn't really raised, what's the uh, American national interest in continuing with the um, pressure campaign on Iran? What does America really stand to gain from all of this? Particularly, we've seen Congress push back against the White House's deep alliance with Saudi Arabia. Uh, they weren't able to override the veto, but there, there's been pressure from Congress. Where, why shouldn't the U.S. just let the regional players um, fix this themselves? And secondly, the U.S. is using its sanctions tool here very strongly. Um, as Dov said, this is the one area where the U.S. really has dominance. Isn't overuse going to kill the sanction tool over time for areas where the national interest really resides? Thank you. Well, sanctions clearly have a, a shelf life. Um, and we, we addressed it here a little earlier that um, if you overdo it, um, you're likely to lose what I would call the moral high ground in that your, your supporters are going to be concerned about the imposition that is occurring to them that's different than the imposition that's occurring to you. And so um, holding that together is going to be tough um, for an extended period of time. It's always been the challenge with sanctions. Um, we've gotten a lot better at applying them, a lot more precise at applying them, a lot better at, at tying them to the end state objective. But at the end of the day, it's still very hard um, to sustain them. And as you say, overuse um, as an end state becomes a real problem for the person who's applying it. Well, I, I think that you need to know what you want your sanctions for. And I think the discussion has shown that there's still a somewhat a lack of clarity as to what, and that was really your first question, your first question. which is what are our objectives? Now, I think there are clear some, clearly some objectives. We do care about our alliances with the Gulf Arab states. We do care about the alliance with Israel, whether it's a formal alliance or informal. We care about those countries. They feel threatened. And so that is a clear concern. Obviously, oil is not a concern in that respect. On the other hand, we care about the Japanese and Korean economies who do depend on that oil. Mm -hmm. So there, it, it's almost like caring by extension, if you will. But are those kinds of concerns sufficient to sustain sanctions for a very, very long time uh, that I don't know because, again, the, 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 the patient, Americans get bored with their policies. <laughs> they just do. And if they last long enough, uh, you know, there, there are exceptions. South Africa was clearly an exception. But remember, everybody supported the opposition to apartheid. Just about everybody did. It was different. Not everybody, not 180 countries, but an awful lot of them. And, and, and the American public did. And so that's different. It's qualitatively different from something like this. Ali, you want to add anything on what's the U.S. interest in? OK. Uh, we'll go to Hiba Nasser with Sky News. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for giving us this. Uh, my question would be on the coalition that the United States want to uh, seeking to build with the EU countries. 
to what extent this coalition could be useful if the strategical objectives for every country is different than the others. For example, the EU countries want to save the GCPOA and uh, the United States want, a change, want to change the entire beha behavior of the Iranians. So uh, could this affect the coalition? I mean, whenever you're going to put a coalition together where you have disparate views of, of what the end state looks like, the first thing you do is sit down at the table and say, where do we all agree? And then you try to work yourself out from that as to how much can be done by the coalition and how much it's unrealistic to pull the coalition together because they can't have a common objective. And so that's the challenge right now is, in, and, and what I see CENTCOM doing is putting everybody at the same table and saying, where do we agree? What is it we can agree on? And then work from that. Yeah, I think the, the one area that there seems to be agreement on is the uh, freedom of navigation in the Strait of Hormuz. Um, that most people, most countries do agree on. Beyond that, I don't know. And even in terms of that, how you implement, how you implement it is yeah. still not yet fully agreed upon. Uh, and so I think uh, Commander CENTCOM's got a few things to work on. Okay. Uh, we're going to go, actually, you've, uh, the lady here, you've had your hand up for, for a while. Hang on. Hi, my name is Pascal Siegel. I'm a managing director at Ankara Consulting. Um, my question is, we haven't talked much about what the impact of these escalating crises means for the smaller, less powerful members of the GCC, and I'm particularly interested in what the possible repercussions are for Oman. Yeah. Very good question, Ali. The, the Omani foreign minister was just in, in, in well, Iran I mean, on I Friday. D I don't see much repercussions for Oman because they maintain ties with both parties, um, and I don't think... Uh, Mm -hmm. I think they've been abiding generally by sanctions, but they're another node where, where there is a lot of smuggling uh, to Iran. The Romanis have caused uh, um, some discomfort uh, with the, with the Saudi-led coalition because of the leakages across the border um, of smuggling weapons to Oman, and now they've been making a big effort. I think the U.S. has also helped them in, 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 in working on that border. But, uh, I mean, Oman is, is a peripheral uh, player, and uh, uh, it, I mean, it's the one probably suffering the least from this whole... Uh, the, the, one, the one thing that Oman could be important for is, as, as it's been in the past in many, many contexts, as a vehicle for some kind of reaching out on, uh, together, reaching together but on both no sides. there's no shortage of vehicles, right? There's no shortage of vehicles. They tend to be one of them. Uh, precisely because they, you know, the, the Omanis historically have feel a debt of gratitude, at least the, the, the Sultan does, to, uh, to the Iranians because of Dofar years and years ago. Uh, and because... the Iranians, though. That's true, but they don't seem to act that way. Uh, they, they still have that sense of debt. Um, they get along well with us, obviously. Um, they get along well with the, uh, the other Gulf uh, GCC countries. And they like being a vehicle for negotiation. They really like it. You know, they're kind of like the, the Middle Eastern Swedes and Norwegians, you know? <laughs> okay. Uh, can I go here? Yes, my name is Juliet Adams, and my field of study is security policy and, and terrorism. I have a very simple question for the panelists. There was nearly a recent strike of Iran not too long ago, which was called off. With this intellectual conversation that we've had, why do you think it was, and should it ever have been? Thank you. Why do you think it was called off, or why do you think it was called on? Off. Both. Called called off. Why was it called off? Oh, why was it called off? Yes. Sure. That's very simple. The president realized it would affect his election. End of story. General? Uh, I mean, to have pursued it would have put you on the other side of the escalation ladder into the kinetic side, which has been the demarcation. 
<laughs> declared or undeclared, we have stayed away from kinetic activities and strikes thus far. To go there for an objective that would not have really changed the behavior would have put us in a position only to escalate in that venue, probably took away more options from the president than he, get, he got out of it. Now, I don't know what his calculus was, okay? But at the end of the day, I think as we said, one, it made it very clear to the Iranians who they were gonna negotiate with. Two, it kept from moving in up the escalatory ladder unnecessarily. And, and three, it kind of boxed things in right now. So if you take the next step and you go kinetic, you have now justified my going kinetic rather than the other way around. And I think that played into the calculus, maybe not of the president, but certainly of um, some of the diplomats and some of the military leaders. I, I th uh, frankly, the last sentence saved what you said because, <laughs> quite, because yeah. quite honestly, when the president made that decision 10 minutes before, it was time to go, it's pretty clear that he did not think it through as analytically, as clearly, <laughs> and as eloquently as General Cartwright. <laughs> Bill, uh, over here. Uh, you've all made references to domestic opinion. Mike. Although, you've all made, uh, William Lawrence, uh, GW, you've all made references to, to domestic opinion, Iranian opinion, and I agree with the analysis that you're making, <laughs> but I'd just like to game that out a little bit. So. We had major protests in 2009 and 2017. We know the Iranian population, large swaths of it, are not happy with these guys. And we know that the maximalist pressure is pushing the Iranian population, for the reasons you've evoked and others, towards supporting the regime. How can you manage this crisis in a way that goes back right, to, to wedging, to, to creating, uh, 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 to signaling support for that, those democratic or those resistance um, aspirations of the population, because right now we're going in the wrong direction on that aspect, and against what Bolton and others have argued, which you suggested as well. Okay. Uh, my sense is um, you can't. I mean, I, I've watched, you know, we, we have prayed for every adversary to self-destruct, okay? And even when they do, Soviet Union case in point, what comes back afterwards is really bigger, better, worse type stuff. Um, I mean, I think that you pay homage to that in, in verbiage and in messaging, um, but to count on it to change um, an end state is probably aspirational at best. I, I agree with that. It, 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 you know, uh, one of the difficulties <coughs> is, and we saw that in Egypt, for example, um, fine, you get rid of a Mubarak, and then what happens? Uh, and so, you know, our, frankly, our track record, America's track record in bringing these kinds, the, the, the results we want, bringing them about, is really not all that great. Uh, we had to nuke the Japanese in order to get it that way, and we had to flatten Germany in order to get it that way. And maybe apart from Taiwan and Korea, which both of whom had uh, dictators for quite a long time before they went democratic, it's very hard to point to too many other success stories. So I, th I totally agree with Haas on this. We're gonna, uh, s sorry, we have little time, so we're gonna try to get as many. Why don't we take the last uh, three questions here, here, and here, and then that's it. Let's take them at once. But Thank please you. limit it to one question. Sure. Yeah. I'm Sam, I'm with the Washington Institute. Um, I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about 2020 and how the Iranians kind of evaluate Trump, Bolton, and the candidates and how that factors into their strategic thinking. Great. Uh, in the back. Um, I'll try to shorten my question, but essentially, how can the United States rebuild trust with Iran when Iran seems to build from a narrative of being on, under constant siege and even if it were to play by the rules, it would still be pinched or attacked or surrounded by um, other, um, other enemies. Okay. Over here. Milton Honig, International Center for Terrorism Studies. Uh, why is no mention made of the significance of the nuclear archive, the cache of Iranian weapons lifted by the Mossad from Iran, 
showing, for example, the definite plans at least between before 2003 to build, to construct five nuclear weapons and actually to build the facility for uh, manufacturing these weapons. Very little talk is made of this, but it's, these are significant documents. Should get, uh, they were uh, so stolen by the Mossad in, I think, in about January of 2018 and revealed by uh, Netanyahu in a speech in April of 2018. Uh, Thank you. So uh, why don't we do uh, this? Dov, why don't you speak to the nuclear archives uh, significance and then uh, maybe, General, would you be able to weigh in on uh, the Iranians and the 2020 election? No? no? <laughs> <laughs> well, would you like to, or should we switch roles? <laughs> you take the nuclear archives then, then Dov, the 2020, and then why is Iran to trust, or how do you rebuild trust with, with, with Iran when it played by the rules uh, with the nuclear deal and then the U.S. pulled out? All right, whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, look, th you mentioned Bolton, you mentioned others. There's only, it, there's only one person that, that matters in, on the Republican side in the 2020 elections, and that's uh, Mr. Trump. And obviously, he hasn't pursued a policy that's been particularly friendly towards Iran. So I'd be very surprised if the Iranians would want him reelected. Um, in terms of the Democrats, there seems to be a range um, some are explicitly supporting of simply going back to the JCPOA, although, as I already said, I don't think that can happen in exactly the same way. Others have really not spoken about it. And, and you've got to remember that uh, American elections are not about foreign policy. They're about domestic policy. And uh, I don't think this election will be any different. I don't think that people out in Minnesota or Iowa or Nevada or wherever are going to go, well, I'm voting for or against President Trump because of his Iran policy. Not going to happen. It'll be because of whether you, what you care about in terms of immigration, in terms of health care, in terms of a whole host of issues um, that uh, really have nothing to do with Iran or, or frankly, foreign policy at all. Um, my sense uh, on the other two questions, the nuclear um, first, I mean, there are any number of uh, venues that have been attributed to um, contributing to the knowledge base in Iran. Um, proving any one of them has been difficult, but, but there does seem to be a common thread of some outside help at, some, at different points in history that helped them move along. I, I, that's as much as I can give to it, um, you know, in, in this kind of a forum. In, in the comment associated with how do we expect to get any place, if I'm going to paraphrase here, if we don't understand the adversary's wants and can't address them. And I think that's the key problem. That is the key problem um, in, in my estimation is we have not thought through that side of the equation. You never want to give an ultimatum to somebody that offers them no out, no way to, to move forward. In, in we have essentially, in a denial type of approach, offered nothing <laughs> in return here that's substantive to their security interest. Ali, any uh, final word? The, the issue of trust, I think it's, it's the other way around. Nobody in the Gulf trusts Iran. And uh, it's going to be very difficult for Iran to rebuild that trust. OK. Well, on that note, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking uh, excellent panelists. Thank you. Great team, huh?